Let me thank Werner Gebhardt for his hospitality as well as the staff of Kete Hamburger Colleague for organizing this conference and say that it is a particular pleasure to be here again. What I will attempt before you today is to reconstruct the title and subtitle. Subtitle is background as ultimate institutional structure. The reason I must, and I mean literally must, reconstruct this is really a draft I should integrate into, into my larger project on institution, is above all a promise I have given Werner. Werner and I have spoken about various projects and he always politely suggests, that is, proposes. He does not order or command certain topics and titles. The ontic power of institutions actually a construction by an erstwhile guest of this institution, John Searle, is a syntagma. And Werner and I have come to realize, although we have, we have not yet outright acknowledged, does not really work. Searle actually formulates this differently, the ontic powers of institution. Searle determines the ontic powers in various texts, texts in an almost identical manner. The ontic powers are rights, duties, obligations, authorizations, permissions, privileges, authority, and the like. But regardless of our conversations and regardless of the fact that I have bound myself to necessarily speak about Searle, although I would rather speak about Ernst, Ernst Mali and Franz Weber, I am sure you are aware that I ought, ought is another word that belongs to this protocol, write a chapter dedicated to the power of the institution. Titus Stahl in German has already written in German and quite inspiringly about Searle in two texts from 2011, Institutional Power of Collective Acceptance and Recognition and Soziale Gerechtigkeit und Institutionelle Macht. It seems to me that the origin of all the main ideas today is in circulation with it, so-called social ontology are to be bound in Austrian and German philosophy. For the existence of the noun deontic or deontic, we can thank two students of Alexis Meinung, both born on territory of today's Slovenia. Ernst Mali, the author of Grundgesetze des Zolen, Elemente der Logik des Willen, from 26, and Franz Weber, who defended his doctorate on the topic Die Natur des Gegenstandens, Zolen. First, Mali writes, I quote, to the Logik des Denkens, we ought to add a discipline called Logik des Willens, Willen. However, it would not be a branch of Logik in the sense of the Logik des Begriff, and logic des utile, but rather a part of logic with an analogous name, which we could call deontic. Von Wright, in his book, Deontic Logic, appeared in 51, says that he adapted the word deontic for, example, uh, for uses in a 50, uh, 50 book imperatives categoric categorical, hypothetical, from uh, 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 Dunbar Broad, and uh, his example, deontic statements, deontische Aussagen formen. In Broad, uh, deontic refers to all terms associated with duty, which is not the case in von Wright, who takes it into consideration, also promises and prohibitions. My duty to come to, to the, this institute at the agreed time and speak on this topic, a position in which many of you find yourselves, is also constituted by train and airfares I received from Katja Spranz, various instructions and advice I accepted with the utmost gratitude the request I sent to Dr. Finga for a meeting during my stay here, and certainly my desire, I use the word quite 
deliberately to again meet Raja Sakrani, as well as my name being in, pro in the program of the conference, the duty to harmonize what is about to happen with the announcement, and much more not excluding a sufficiently justifiable or important, convincing, correct reason against such a commitment or commitments. The word reason, reason for my action, reason to come or not absent myself, added to all the verbs I so casually used, together with the verbs you could add and are true for each one of you separately, ought to constitute what we call institutional reality. To boot, these verbs in one way or another could be reduced or subsumed within the word deontic. Is it really necessary so? To begin, I will attempt to briefly explain what is institutional reality and what are its characteristics. In a word, what makes something count institutionally? Does this institutional scene I'm trying to understand here now have anything to do with the norm or with the pseudo or neo-normative paradigm mentioned by Werner Gebhardt in the, in the introduction of this conference? At the end of his introduction, Gebhardt quotes George Herbert Mead that war, that war surpasses national and cultural boundaries and probably forms a completely new collective identity. Uh, Gebhardt writes about the Great War, Image de la Grande Guerre, La Culture de Guerre, in the book Voyage Sociologique Fran France-Allemagne. And uh, also John Searle mentions the norm and normativism very rarely or nearly never. It is important because, because for the next, next, you can say, arguments. More precisely, do the verbs I use stand in a certain relation to the order that could explain or institutionalize the group our group. Does the process of institutionalization, the de facto function of the norm is to institutionalize, produce what we usually call power? How do we create power and is a we, we are, really power? What are all the things that determine social or institutional fact that we are together these few days, that we have become a we, and that our cooperation contains a collective intentionality. I have used the same verbs as Thomas Wright in a brief account of Aristotle's logic from 1774. I quote, Aristotle observes justly that besides that kind of speech called a proposition, which is always either true or false, there are other kinds which are neither true nor false, such as prayer or wish, to which we may add a question, a command, a promise, a contract, and many others. However, John Sir practically reduces all verbs that construct institutional reality to commands and adopts from the von Wright, von Wright the definitions that will come to determine his understanding of positive and negative deontic powers. Searle's status function is from Wright's deontic status or normative, normative relationship. I quote Wright. Similarly, when the uttering of a command sentence constitutes an act of commanding, there exists henceforth and for a time a relationship between the giver and the receiver of the command the commander and the commanded. We could call this a normative relationship. When I say that I particularly desired to meet Raja and Verna here after a few months, and that this is one of the reasons why I'm here, I believe many of you could say the same or will be able to do in a few months, when I insist on a social and entirely para or pseudo-legal pseudo phenomenon, 
the world the word politeness in Slavic languages contains the word love just as the word for friendship has the word for comfort a friend is one with whom I am comfortable then I am opening for myself the possibility not only to show the importance of norms as desires norms as desires is a new idea at the origin of which are Kelsen's theory of norms and the vision of Ernst Mali, for example, in a book explaining norms, norms as desire, Brandon Erickson, Goodin and Southwood uh, from Oxford University Press 2013, but conduct two operations that would most succinctly, uh, succinctly allow me to explain the title and subtitle of my present project. First, I would like to prioritize and reevaluate the difference between the norm as Gedanke and the norm as Realität with respect to contemporary divisions of norms into formal and informal or legal, moral and social norms. Second, I would like to suggest that we consider the theory of the ontic powers of institution. I hope I have compared some ten texts by John Searle from 95 to 2012 in the shadow of its four secret normativist gestures which are the conditionless conditions of its theoretical actions. First, or A, Searle translates from Wright's deontic status and normative relations, relationship and builds them into his own theory of the institution. Namely, the reduction of norms to commands and reduction of the normative relationship to an asymmetrical relation of power between two, one who, who is commander, the other who is commanded, completely disregards the nature of a group and different kinds of statement that exist within it. A group is not a collection of normative relationships between each two of its individual members, at this moment, I'm addressing all of you, and I'm not commanding either Verna or any of you individually. B. Searle transfers his own resistance to Hume and Bernard Williams' in internalist position that desires constitute the basis, or at least a necessary component of the reason for action and to his theory of the institution and the powers of the institution desire independent reason for actions as one of the conditions for institutional action mm -hmm. is in conflict with the fact that, for example, sexuality can be satisfied within marriage or greed within the institution of private property. C. Searle privileges speech over writing, which shows that paradoxically norms for him represent either neither linguistic acts and entities, a linguistic phenomenon, nor social facts, but rather a world of pure objects that need not at all be realized. It is important that this world be harmonized with human rationality. He follows Kelsen entirely and thinks that the norm remains a norm even if entirely ineffective. Auch die wirkungslose norm bleibt norm. In con contrast, for example, Santi Romano writes in L'Ordinamento Juridico, I quote, an uninstitution is not a demand of reason, an abstract principle, some ideal quid, but real being, something real, ente effectivo. And D, Searle smuggles legal and not social norms into the foundations of institution, which implies that institutions are not an alternative to the state and laws, not really counter-institutions, or contre-institution, a term by Saint-Simon, but are rather essentially tied to the state. If legal norms are supported by coercive state, institutions are always dependent on this institution of institutions, the institution der institution, or on the ultimate institutional structure. This is the state. 
To quote Carl Schmitt in German from Über die drei Arten der rechtwissenschaftlichen Denkens from 34, 34, der Staat selbst ist für die institutionalische Denkweise nicht mehr eine Norm oder ein Normensystem, auch keine bloße souveräne Dezision, sondern die Institution der Institutionen, in deren Ordnung zahlreiche andere in sich selbstständige Institutionen ihren Schutz und ihre Ordnung finden. Santi Romano uses the identical formulation in paragraph 12 of L'Ordinamento Juridico. Searle quoting of Schmidt in his last book from 2010 as well that of Max Weber in the text Human Social Reality and Language from 2012 are both entirely unwarranted. Which leads to the question how does the norm function within institutional reality or institutional realism. It seems to me that an all antagonism between Benedetto Croce, Realtà della Legge, and Santi Romano's Realtà Juridica could finally be formulated with much more accuracy. Law, from the perspective of institutional realism, that is empirical ontology of law, is not a set of abstract entities, norms, values, duties, but rather a set of social facts. I think that social facts correspond, for example, to Theodor Geiger's subsistente norm, Alf Roh's social state of affairs, Adolf Reinach or Herbert Spiegelberg's Zonensachverhalt, or Gerhard Husserl's Rechtssachverhalt. Indeed, legal norms are above all linguistics, linguistic acts and entities created necessarily by the lawgiver. Norms are never pure and independent, nor do they exist without interpretation. When he writes about Thomas P. Wilson and his differentiating between a normative and interpretative paradigm, Gephard says that the norm is rendered concrete through interpretation. In the Die Norm als Gedanke und Realität, Otta Weinberger writes, I quote, my reflections refer to the ontological status of, of the norm. I would actually like to show that my concept of the two aspects of the norm, the first being its ideality, idealität, as thought, as an ideal construction, Gedankengebilde, and the second its social reality, Gesellschaftliche Realität, is precisely relevant because it concerns the nature and the problem of the legal science. And then, a little further on, I quote, ideality and reality can be conceptually opposed to one another in such a way that one could fundamentally lose the sense that it is the reality of a thought that is being spoken about and also the reality of the norm. This happens, for example, when reality is supposed to coincide with the material things, when the only thing defined as the real is what can be perceived with the senses or identified and as extant by way of physics instruments. It's fair. Thus, the real can be defined as everything that exists in time, as the place where the power of cognition is entirely separate from the sphere of reality and the criterion of existence. The real existence of norms is thus in close relationship with the existence of social institutions, with the existence of the group, our group, whose functioning is above all observable. Thus, the group, the group is the group, we are, we, we are, when we are visible, and when the connections among us are visible. Still, using Searle's, and not only Searle's language, what gives reality or actuality to norms within an institution? Or what is, and that turns it into power? For example, Maurice Mor or you point, uh, points out the connection between power and the institution in La Théorie de l'Institution de la Fondation de, de, de 25. Uh, never mind for. Is it enough to say that social norms constitute institutional reality? 
also. Is it necessary to differentiate among, among social norms? As far back in uh, 95, Tuomela, Raimo Tuomela, a Finnish philosopher, developed the notion of collective intentionality similar to Searle's and made a distinction, uh, possibly suspect, between rules and norms, but very, very good. Collective, what is collective intentionality? What is collective intentionality of this group? Arises when an individual attributes an intention to the group in which he or she belongs while holding that intention and believing that other group members hold it too. We act this, we act we act thus because we believe that others have a similar aim. Clearly, many behavioral regularities develop in society because of such reciprocating intentions and expectations. Tuomela described regularities as norms. They involve a network and mutual beliefs beliefs, huh? beliefs, not the, the antique, uh, rather than actual agreements between individuals. Norms involve approval and disapproval. In contrast, rules are, are the product of explicit agreement brought about by some authority, and they imply sanctions. It seems to me that the claim trivial unimportant and all too simplified that this group, our group, the institution, which is identified as a group, which works as a group and is affirm, affirmed as such to the constituting of various projects, which means it will exist yet another day, is efficient. Together, we are certainly capable of more than in isolation and always considerate towards new members. For example, in contrast to law or the contract, the institution counts on the third, one who has still not arrived and become its member or new fellow, all of which is associated with the power. This is trivial. Huh? Has power, is power, or is constantly augmenting its power. Even if it is now necessary to show the origin of this power and then locate this power with the utmost precision, I am unconvinced that Searle's positions can be of any use. John Searle's mantra regarding the haunting powers has remained unchanged for 20 years and it unfolds in several bars. First, power is carried, increased. That means stat status forms are the vehicles of powers. The ontic powers or the ontology is the key thing that distinguished us from animals. The formulation that the ontic powers are the glue and the thing that binds and holds us together appears for the first time in 2010 and 2012. Language by which is meant exclusively spoken acts is an institution that institute yes 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 that institutionalize all other institutions and the haunting powers do not exist without language institutional facts never constrain as Dierkheim or Foucault would have it institutions never limit us or take away our freedom Searle wonders in numerous places why do people accept institutions and institutional facts and answers for our benefit by increasing our powers. Finally, here are three ob objections or difficulties with the ontic powers, which could possibly explain my intention with the bizarre subtitle of this short paper, Background as Ultimate Institutional Structure. What is background? I quote Searle, the basic concept of background power is that there is a set of background presuppositions, attitudes, dispositions, capacities, and practices of any community that set normative constraints on the members of that community in such a way that violations of those constraints are subject to the negative imposition of sanctions by any member of the community. The first difficulty refers to the definition or the determination of power that Searle uses. 
the basic manifestation of power is one that forces people to do what they, wo what, what they would rather not. If the institution is the alternative name for power, if these two words are somehow synonymous, then Searle's basic motto, desire independent reason for actions, become, becomes clear. Institution is power because it is making me to do what I do not wish to, or as Searle puts it, force without using force. To act institutionally thus really means to be rational and follow norms, norms in the sense of orders and norms in the sense of that which Tomella calls rules. Problematic here is that the institution, according to Searle, does not in principle coerce the police, about which Searle speaks often when writing about the ontic powers, holds a monopoly of force. In addition, the problem, and this immediately leads us into the second and third difficult, dif difficulties, is that the ontic powers are not powerful enough. I quote, but the ontic powers, in the, for example, when you have a corporations, when you want to register corporations or company, but the ontic powers stop at the point where the larger society requires some official documentation. They lack full the ontic powers. Collective recognition is not enough. There has to be official recognition by some agency, itself supported by collective recognition, and there have to be status indicators issued by the official agency. The insufficiency that Searle speaks about refers to the difficult transformation of transfer of a social fact into institutional one. To reinforce or stabilize collective recognition, it is necessary to de facto draw or extract or activate the document from some, in this case, third place. My point, however, is not to claim that there is a necessarily something outside the institution, something extra-linguistic or some necessary authority, special or not, the state in the form of power and violence, or violence. Rather, is, it is that an institutional fact is immediately preceded by the document in the broadest sense of the term. Ferraris, a fellow at this institution, has, as you know, thematized documentality. And if I now had to document this paradoxical moment in Serbian language, I would take sentence he writes about the corporation in his, in his latest book, Making the Social World. I quote, so the law is a declaration that authorizes other declaration, declarations. In this case, law is the document, and it is not at all surprising that it's precisely when we arrive at a complex case creating a corporation that the special role of writing is problematized and the sitagmas like writing language, written speech acts, written constitutive rules, etc., etc. In order to preserve the secret guarantor of normative power, ultimate institutional structure or, or, or state, Searle, who is particularly interested in l'ontology de la création of the, of the institutions, performs two moves or gestures I would like to mention. The first, in essence Kantian, is that we ought not to not wreck our brains too much about the origin of, the, of that most important of institutions, the state, or how it functions, or about the violence or power necessary for its creation. How does Searle answer this paradox regarding authorization? I'm very sorry, yes. But your three minutes is over. Could I ask you to come to your conclusion? Yes. The second move is the mystification of the first one. Searle first clears up and protects the state from Foucault's anti institutionalism and his understanding of power and the state as a machine exclusively for coercion. This was invented a new fiction instance background to which Searle now assigns regulative power and coercive technique usually practiced by state. I think this strategy is not correct and it serves no purpose. Thank you.